Can you hear me, Dr. Capale? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Okay, so welcome everyone. Just a few housekeeping items. I have muted all of you by default. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, uh, please make sure to use the chat uh, to ask those questions. Even if there are some technical difficulties, please put those in the chat window and I will be monitoring those uh, and I will interfere if, if I need to. And then we will uh, um, uh, take up the questions at uh, the uh, conclusion of the lecture. So welcome to this 2020 Nobel Prize lecture uh, for physics. Uh, we started this activity in uh, 2011 for the benefit of our students as well as general public that are interested in science and the prize winning work in physics. Uh, in fact, on a couple of occasions, we were also able to give lecture on the Nobel prizes in chemistry for that year. Uh, the 2020 Nobel prize in physics was given to three individuals, Roger Penrose, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Gaze. Uh, it was divided one half awarded to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. And the other half was given jointly to Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Gaze uh, for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. I actually had the pleasure of uh, hearing Andrea Gaze a few years back in the Optical Society of America annual meeting. Uh, so that was quite kind of interesting to uh, hear even at that stage. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Esteban Araya. Uh, he also gave our inaugural uh, Physics Nobel Prize lecture in 2011 on the expansion of universe. And he also gave the last year's uh, uh, Nobel Prize lecture happened to be again uh, in the area of astronomy on exoplanets and cosmology. Uh, Professor Araya is uh, a faculty member in the physics department uh, since 2009, I believe. His uh, research focuses on the study of massive star formation and the interstellar medium. Uh, he carries out observations at uh, radio frequencies and uses some of the most sophisticated uh, radio telescopes located all over the world. Uh, he received his uh, Doctor of Philosophy uh, a, with an emphasis in uh, astrophysics uh, from the physics department at New Mexico Tech. Uh, before that, he did his master's work in Puerto Rico and his bachelor's work in uh, Costa Rica. So uh, uh, well, let's welcome uh, Dr. Araja. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk. And uh, let me just briefly tell you the, talk, the, the title of the talk, which is Understanding Black Hole Formation and the Discovery of Supermassive Black Hole at the Center of Milky Way, which is our own home, our own galaxy. So take it away, Dr. Araja. Great, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Kapali. And, and hi, everyone, and thank you for for coming uh, virtually to this to this talk, um, yeah. So we're we're celebrating uh, the the Nobel Prize in in physics in 2020. So so as Dr. Capale was mentioning, uh, it was uh, uh, we also have the the rule of uh, three uh, in this this case. So uh, in physics has been happening quite a bit that the Nobel Prize is is, is split in uh, half to one of the scientists and, 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 and quarters to the, other, to the other two. And sometimes it appears to be a little bit artificial the way that they do it, but this year I think is, is quite appropriate. So one half of the prize uh, is uh, awarded to Roger Penrose. Uh, he's at uh, the University of Oxford in um, the UK. And uh, the other half was, was split between um, uh, Reinhard Gensel and, uh, and Professor Andrea Guess. And um, one, uh, Dr. Gensel is at the Max Planck Institute in Germany and also at, uh, at Berkeley. And um, uh, Dr. Andrea Guess at the University of California, Los Angeles. So uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, right, uh, the, the Nobel Prize was, um, was split in, uh, in, in basically in two, two areas, one theoretical and one observational. So in the case of Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the theory of general relativity. 
and uh, the other half uh, that is for the uh, discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. Well, this uh, uh, tradition that we, we started getting to 10 years ago now, uh, celebrating the Nobel Prizes uh, every, every year, it's, uh, yes, I think it's a quite nice uh, activity that we have in the physics department. And, uh, and in many occasions, we have had it at the end of the semester, uh, which is kind of nice, right? It's a way of celebrating what, what, what is happening in, in, uh, in our field. Uh, in, and I think particularly this year, right? The 2020, what a year. Uh, it's, it's actually great that we are kind of at the, at the end of the semester and we can, we can celebrate we can celebrate something. There have been so many challenges, right, affecting uh, so many people. Um, however, there are non, not only uh, challenges, but also there have been opportunities. And as like a huge fraction of the population, right, certainly yeah. of the US, but in many, many other countries, uh, the, the idea of remote teaching basically exploded, right? So. so it's quite a bit of, of uh, online learning happening right now. And of course, that has advantages and, and disadvantages, but uh, certainly has, has lots of opportunities. And, um, and just to give you a, 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 an example of amazing uh, kind of opportunities, uh, it's just a, a screenshot from a meeting uh, of my, my, my laboratory uh, that we had last Tuesday. Uh, so, so this one, um, yeah, again, yeah, just a few days ago. Uh, the curious thing is that we call it the Astrolab meeting, uh, but no one was in the Astrolab that is in, in, uh, in Currents Hall. So, um, uh, uh, Wei, a, a former student, uh, we conduct, we're still doing research together in Singapore, uh, Natalie in, in, uh, in near Chicago, um, a former student um, in Oregon, uh, a prospective student uh, that is here also attending, um, Habib uh, from uh, Bangladesh, and uh, Trishika, um, uh, who is actually a high school student uh, in Iowa, and was attending the, the, the meeting from India, um, where she is, is visiting uh, uh, her family. So it's actually quite quite amazing. And, and again, this, uh, this crisis has given us the, the opportunity of, um, giving um, high school students the, the chance of uh, being involved in, in the work that we do at the physics department. Uh, and, uh, and we can do it virtually. So it's, uh, it's working out. So in the case of Trishika, again, she's a high school student from Iowa and now is visiting India and she continues her studies uh, in Iowa remotely and can uh, attend our, our Astrola meetings and conduct uh, research work with, with us, uh, as well as she is taking the, the physics 101, the, the introductory to astronomy here at Western. Another high school student that has been working with us for actually uh, almost two years now, uh, Kate Rick uh, from Augusta, Illinois, so a little drive from, from Macomb. Uh, and here he's all proud, uh, time before COVID, presenting a poster um, based on the research that we, that we, that we are doing. Well, uh, in, in their cases, uh, they are actually working on some data that we obtained uh, this summer with a very large array. A very large array is a, a huge radio telescope in New Mexico, 27 antennas, and uh, they're distributed in, in this, this, this plane here. Uh, and we can use this, this telescope program, the telescope, and then we can, we can get the data. And it takes months and months, in many cases, years and years, to be able to analyze everything and, and uh, extract conclusions from that. And one of the, the uh, objects of things that we, we studied, as Dr. Kapala mentioned, is uh, star formation. So actually this, this uh, Tuesday, uh, when I was working with Trishika, we were working analyzing some of this data that we obtained with the very large array. And, and this is one of the uh, graphs that we were discussing this, this past Tuesday. Uh, so, so this graph shows amplitude, what that means is brightness for, for this, this uh, audience is, 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 is all that is needed to understand, right? So how bright the object is, and here is time. Okay, and the observations were done in June this year. So, so basically we observe one object that was really bright and then we observe another object that was not that bright, another object, and we repeat it again, the observations. That is kind of what is shown, this, this graph. Okay, um, what are those uh, things that we observe? 
Uh, so, so this bright thing here, again, how bright it is versus time at the beginning of the run, we observed something that was really bright. It's a type of calibrator. Uh, and then we observe another calibrator here and we observe the star forming region that we are interested. In fact, this one uh, here, G3426. So this is a weird name. Uh, it's basically the coordinates of the object in, in our galaxy. This is a region where stars are forming. So we observed that object and then we had to observe the calibrator again and the object again and, and so forth for an hour or so. That's kind of what we did. Um, and basically you get all that data and then you can uh, obtain images, construct images of uh, the objects that you observe. And this is for instance, one um, uh, image of precisely this object, G3426, not, not from this data, we're still analyzing this, we, we haven't, uh, uh, made images yet, but this is from some other VLA data that, um, that we have available. And uh, yeah, what we see here, these this bright patches here are, are places where uh, new stars are forming. They are so hot that the gas gets really hot in, and then they glow in, uh, in microwaves and radio waves and we can detect that. Well, um, where is that uh, region of star formation? So this is a, a diagram uh, that represents the structure of our galaxy based on data. It's an artist's conception. Of course, we cannot go out of the galaxy to take a picture. Um, but uh, it shows here is the solar system. So it's representing the sun here. Uh, the complete solar system, the sun, Earth, all the way to Pluto, all what you can think about solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, all that stuff is far smaller than the size of my pointer far smaller, right, a complete solar system. All the stars that you see at night, the individual stars with the naked eye are in a region that is not much greater than, than this big circle here. And the rest is that white kind of light that you see in a clear night uh, in Macomb uh, when it's, uh, the, the, it's the Milky Way. Well, the object that um, uh, Rishika and Kate and Natalie, one of the sources that she, she's studying, and Wei, also one of the sources that we're studying, uh, and is, uh, is located there. The G34 source is, is more or less there. It's around 10,000 light years away from, uh, from us, kind of thing. Okay. All right. Uh, and again, we're studying how these stars form and that process is still um, unclear. However, we know that somehow the gravity collapses the material and is able to generate a star. And then the stars uh, burn hydrogen into helium and that make them glow. And then later on, they will run out of their fuel in the center and there will be an explosion, the very, very massive stars. So we're talking about a star of so more than 20 solar masses. Um, and that is uh, kind of what we, what we understand. Now, um, what about what is left behind in the center of one of these very, very massive stars? Again, more than around 20 solar masses or so. Well, the answer to that um, came from understanding gravity. And um, what, 105 years ago, uh, we, we got uh, our current best description of what gravity is um, because of the work by Albert Einstein. So before Einstein, uh, gravity was understood in Newtonian mechanics as some type of magical force in the sense that uh, you have Earth and you have the moon and they are not connected. There is no spring, there, there is empty space between them and somehow there is a force that attracts the moon and that uh, makes the moon go in the, in the orbit around, around Earth. And uh, mathematically it works just great. Uh, however, even Newton uh, was kind of uncomfortable with the idea that somehow this force acts at a distance in uh, how, how to explain that, right? Well, again, it wasn't until uh, Albert Einstein and um, observations that showed that uh, Newton's uh, law of gravity was not given the correct results in very careful observations uh, that after uh, 10 years of work, basically uh, uh, Albert Einstein was able to understand that gravity is better, um, it's better to see gravity not like a force, but like um, um, a, a property of space in time. Uh, so that uh, if you have an object that has mass, 
it disturbs the space around, it curves the space around. And then an object like the moon going around Earth, it's not that you have a force that is uh, acting at the distance, it's that the space uh, in which the moon is moving is curved. And the moon is uh, following a straight line, but it's a curved space, so that generates an orbit. Uh, and that was the, the great realization of, of um, Einstein, that you could understood gravity, not like a, like a force, but a property of a space and time. And that was a, a big, a big step forward. Now, in order to do this, Einstein had to uh, use really complex mathematics. And for the, for the students, uh, basically is using uh, four-dimensional tensors. And, um, and, and in the, the, the mathematics are actually quite quite complicated. In fact, if you were to uh, to understand general relativity, the, the typical uh, class is you take six months of all the introduction of all the math that you need, and towards the end of the six months is that you see the equations of uh, of field of Einstein, and then in the next six months is that you start solving the equations. Right? That's kind of how how it works. Um, so actually, Einstein uh, was able, with that some approximations, to solve uh, one of the uh, problems that Newton, Newtonian mechanics was not working. Uh, that was the, the, the precession of the orbit of Mercury. So Mercury was moving kind of weird, and uh, Einstein was able to explain the motion of, of Mercury in its orbit. Uh, and and uh, there is the story that Einstein basically said, well, it's, uh, I can go to sleep now. And, and the point was that the, the math was so complex that it was possible that there would be never be a solution, other solutions, exact solutions for, for his equations of, of gravity. Uh, well, that was, that was wrong because uh, just a few weeks after he published the, uh, the, the theory of general relativity in 2015, uh, Carl Schwarzschild, a, uh, a German scientist, actually in the Eastern Front during the first war, solved the equation, uh, the field equations. And, uh, and actually communicated to Einstein, right, that he was able to, to obtain an a exact solution. Uh, what was that, that solution? Well, uh, the idea is that if you have a mass and the mass is uh, uh, it's at the point, right, so it has no volume, it's a point, uh, then that will be a, a perfect solution of the field equations of Albert Einstein. And that will imply that, well, if you have a mass in a point, uh, the, the density is infinite, uh, we call that a singularity, and it will be a distance uh, at which the uh, you will have an interesting property. It's called uh, kind of the event horizon, in which if you have light uh, inside or anything inside that event horizon, uh, simply that that uh, light will be trapped uh, in that region, and therefore wouldn't be able to escape. And therefore, from the outside, you won't be able to obtain information about what is happening inside. And uh, that is what we would call a black hole. All right. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a sad story because uh, Carl Schwarzschild um, died a few months later. And actually, he wasn't able to present this to the scientific community, it was Einstein who, who, who presented the, his solution. Um, now, this idea that you can have an object that has so much mass uh, and so much gravity that light cannot escape uh, was not necessarily completely unexpected. A uh, hundred years before this time, uh, now 200 years ago or so, uh, a couple of, of uh, famous scientists, John Mitchell from, from England and, uh, and Pierre Simon Laplace, actually using just Newtonian mechanics, uh, were able to uh, basically state that if you have an object that has quite a bit of mass, it's quite large, the gravitational force should be strong enough to stop light from escaping. Uh, just using Newtonian mechanics, uh, they were able to, to conclude, for instance, in the case of Mitchell, that if you have a star with the density of the sun, but at 500 times the, the, the size of the sun, then the light wouldn't be able to escape. Uh, quite quite amazing because it was uh, quite quite right, and uh, it it took uh, quite a bit of time for us to understand how right this 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 early scientists were. Now, in the case of uh, general relativity, Carl Schwarzschild was able to find this solution. Um, however, Einstein. Uh, Right there, he said, yeah, it's a really nice solution. Um, however, for sure, it cannot be a physical, right? This cannot happen in real life because the, the solution is, is over simplistic. 
So this is a solution for an object that somehow can collapse to a point and it's not spinning, it's perfectly symmetrical. So, so if you were to change any conditions, right, then the solution wouldn't work anymore. So, so this looked like um, a nice mathematical solution, but no, not really connected to reality. And that is actually what Einstein thought for the rest of, of his life. Um, it was until the next war and the next war passed, 1963, that uh, uh, Roy Patrick Kerr was able to find another analytical solution to the equations of general relativity for an object that was still spherical, but spinning. And that was more realistic, right? If you have a, a star, stars are more or less symmetrical, more or less, and, but they do the spin, right? So uh, he was able to find the solutions so for the general relativity um, equations for objects that are spinning. And he was able to show that also you will have a singularity in uh, uh, event horizon uh, um, area uh, that if you're inside, light wouldn't be able to escape. And, um, and again, this was eight years after Einstein died, more or less. So it's uh, uh, kind of a pity that Einstein didn't realize that it, that was it was kind of possible. Now, this was again a specific case, right? Our object is perfectly symmetric, is spinning, but this is still quite, quite specific. Um, the breakthrough came that year uh, with the work of, uh, of George uh, Penrose that basically thought, okay, so if uh, we have these two solutions for the uh, general relativity that gives these objects for which the light cannot escape, right? These black holes, they were not called black holes back then, but that, that, that's the idea. Uh, is this a, a, a really peculiarity or, or is this a general result? So that is what he uh, did. He analyzed the solution of general relativity equations without the assumptions of a spherical symmetry and um, had to introduce new methods to study uh, the, the family of solutions and including a concept called a, a trapped surface. And this was the, the breakthrough. Uh, let me explain a little bit what this trapped surface uh, means. So let's say that we have a light bulb, right? And I am going to turn on and off the light bulb. Right, so I'm going to turn it on right now. Off, I'm going to turn it on, and then when I turn it on, uh, a, a, a front of light, a light front, will be generated, right? And that light front will propagate in time, right? So turn on the light and light bulb, and then basically you have a sphere of light traveling downwards. Okay, uh, let me turn it off again, uh, and uh, before I turn it on again, uh, let me uh, measure things. Okay, so I turn it off, I'm gonna turn it on and I will stop when the light is at this point here. So after a little bit of time, uh, that light will have traveled certain distance and it will be over here. So um, I'm gonna uh, be tracking what the light is doing in space in this plane, okay? A distance of the space. Now uh, this, source of light is generating light in three dimensions, right? The, the light bulb is generating light in three dimensions. Um, but that is kind of hard to visualize. Uh, so instead, let's um, keep track of what the light is doing in two dimensions, two as, as, uh, dimensions of space. So, so I'm gonna keep track of the front, the light front uh, right here on this plane. So at the beginning was right in the center, you turn on the light, then it will propagate and it gets bigger, okay? So let's track what the light is doing, uh, not in three dimensions of space, like represented here, but in two dimensions of space in one dimension of time. So the idea is that I'm gonna be tracking what this light front is doing in space, that will be uh, this axis here, and how it is evolving in time in this axis here, okay? So at the beginning, uh, we have that the light will be right here at the center. So at the beginning uh, of the experiment, time, time equals zero here, all the light is there uh, right where the light bulb is. And then I turn on the light and then the, the front propagates and it will move certain distance in a space, so certain distance in a space here, and it will move in time. This is later on in time, right? So moves in time and moves in a space. Okay, then uh, after a little bit more time, 
then that front continues getting bigger and bigger and bigger, propagating. Uh, now uh, it will have covered more space. So now it will have covered more space here and uh, it will be later in time. And again, it continues propagating. So more and more space later in time. We can actually represent this uh, with a cone uh, that is kind of showing how light uh, is just propagating in the space and time. And this are uh, this is called Minkowski cones. And, uh, and they are kind of really useful because uh, allows us to investigate the connection between things. So for instance, if we have two objects, one object is the light bulb here and another object right here, uh, those two objects wouldn't be able to interact until that light gets to that other object. So, so if I have two objects, one here and the other one here, uh, this other object that is in this point in a space wouldn't be able to know about the existence of this other one until the light from that object reaches uh, the first one. So uh, it will be certain amount of time until that information, that light can get to the other object and then you can, you can see it. So, so the idea of this one is that if you are in this cone of a space and time, uh, then you can interact with this object here. If you are outside of the cone, then you, you, you don't interact with it. Uh, the same happens, so this is kind of representing the future of interactions of this, this object with the rest of the universe and the same story with the past. So, so objects that are in this cone here uh, emitting light, uh, for instance, will be able to interact with the object in the present, but any object that is outside of this cone wouldn't be able to interact with the object in the present until later on in the future. That's kind of the idea. Okay, so here comes Roger Penrose and uh, start thinking about, okay, this connection between these uh, this light cones and what is happening with uh, gravity because gravity is modifying the space and, and time and what happens when you have a star and the star collapses. All right, so here, let's take a look at this, at this diagram. Here I have my star. And again, uh, instead of tracking what is happening in, in three dimensions of a space, I'm gonna track what is happening in these two dimensions. So just this cut. So, uh, so here in this direction, we have a space. And again, in this other direction, we have time. So at the beginning, we have that the star has a certain radius. So this is the radius of the star. This is the radius of a star. And after a while, the star gets smaller, okay? So the radius of the star is smaller. So this is uh, this this cone can, gets a, a little bit uh, narrower. Okay. So what uh, Roger Penrose realized was that uh, if this process continues and the and the object becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, there is a moment in which that event horizon develops, and these cones uh, tilt in a way that uh, these cones of light basically point inwards uh, and, and that re basically represents that if you have a, let's say a flashlight and you send light in this direction, send light in that direction, if you are past this event horizon, then the, that, that light will converge again later on. Uh, so, 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 so basically the light gets, gets trapped in uh, this, this region inside the event horizon. So this is the idea of a, of a black hole. And then the material can continue uh, getting uh, denser and denser and denser, uh, forming uh, that, that singularity that, that was, was mentioned before. So the, uh, the huge contribution of, of Roger Penrose was to realize that this uh, type of surfaces where you, you have light, uh, the light gets trapped, um, those are stable solutions of the equations of general relativity. And if you perturb the system, the, the, the solution remains. So, so, so this is a, a robust uh, solution of the, uh, or prediction of the theory. Uh, also it's independent of any assumptions about the symmetry. It's not that it had to be a perfect uh, star that is perfectly symmetric and not a spinning or perfectly symmetric a spinning. No, no, you can have different symmetries. Uh, the point is that if you have these um, trapped surfaces forming. After that, that was it. It doesn't matter the, the symmetry, it doesn't matter anything. Uh, what you will have is material uh, that, that is, uh, has enough uh, gravity that uh, light cannot, cannot escape. 
So, so again, the, the, the big contribution is once you have one, uh, those trap surfaces form, it is impossible within the theory of general relativity uh, to prevent the collapse of material towards a singularity. So, so in other words, uh, the, the idea of the existence of a black hole is not um, some curious solution of the equations. It's kind of the, the, the opposite. It's a robust prediction of the theory. So, so basically, that, uh, that uncomfortable idea of Einstein saying like, no, this is just a curious solution. It's not a general, there's no way that this is happening in nature, was actually the opposite, right? The, the theory predicted that these, these objects should, should exist. And, um, and then, yeah, what do we have uh, in the, the core of a, a very large star after it explodes, the, the core is compressed, uh, there it doesn't have a source of energy to keep it from collapsing, and it, get, it gets a moment and gets uh, small enough that the um, trap surface is, is formed and you have a, a black hole. All right, so that is the, the great uh, contribution of, of Penrose. Um, now, what about, uh, well, let's, let's go back to the, to the, the research that the high school students are, are uh, being involved in my lab. Uh, so again, this figure that uh, Drishika was working on last Tuesday. Uh, so remember the, what uh, this was, so we used a very large array and this shows how bright the object is as a function of time. We had to observe a calibrator and then another calibrator, the region that we're in, interested in, the star forming region where these massive stars are forming. And we have to observe the calibrator again. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of, well, um, we, we have to do this, this, if you observe a calibrator and then you observe your source in the calibrator again, in the source again, uh, because the atmosphere uh, changes. And then if you have light from an object uh, in a space and it crosses the atmosphere, then it will be moving your light around. And then if you try to, to obtain an image, uh, you will get a, a blurry image because uh, the atmosphere has been playing around with the light as it enters the atmosphere. It turns out that in, in uh, the wavelengths I work, in microwaves and radio waves, we can do this. We can observe a calibrator, basically check what the atmosphere is doing. Then we observe our source for a few minutes. Then we observe the calibrator again, and we can then correct for what the atmosphere did, plus other, other, other instrumental uh, uh, aspects. But uh, it, the atmosphere is an important one. Okay, um, yeah, that's kind of what we, what we do. Now, the calibrators that we are using uh, are really small, or the, the, the angular size is small. They look like little dots in the sky. They're really, really bright. And, and therefore, we can use them to do precisely this. Take a look at them and figure out what the atmosphere is doing so we can correct our data and get a nice image of the region of the star. Well, those calibrators are uh, quasars. And quasars, uh, also in 1963, that was another uh, interesting era, uh, it was found out that, that the quasars are, um, are located at very, very uh, uh, long distances from Earth. They are cosmological. They are in other galaxies. And this is a picture of one of them. So quasars are found in the center of galaxies, and they're really, really bright. And, uh, and soon after, 1963, the idea of the, of the black hole solution, it was already uh, being developed. It was quite clear that you will need gravity to generate the amount of energy required to explain quasars. And then in the very center of these galaxies, you will have a black hole where material is falling and energy is transformed uh, into, uh, for instance, electromagnetic radiation to light that we can detect, generating light, uh, jets. And uh, that was the idea of, of quasars. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous of all of this type of objects uh, just came, was in the news all over just a few, what, a year ago or so. Uh, so this is the, the picture of the galaxy M87. Uh, and this is just a section of the galaxy. All this kind of light that you see around are hundreds of billions of stars. And uh, in the very, very center, there is something really, really bright that is pushing material out forming this, this jet. That one is precisely this idea of this jet. So this is an artist's conception. This is a, a photograph obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, this is the, the source that, again, a year ago, uh, telescopes spread over, all over the world were able to see really 
high angular resolution what is happening inside this this region and we're able to see the shadow of one of these supermassive black holes at the center of this of this uh, galaxy it turns out that um, for many uh, sources of, of uh, evidence uh, it seems quite clear that there are supermassive black holes in the center of uh, most galaxies um, most likely all uh, large galaxies um, what about our own so this is our again the, the image or the artist conception of our own galaxy this is the region of star formation that we have been studying uh, here solar system what about at the center of our own galaxy well in order to uh, study what is happening in the center of our own galaxy we have a problem and the problem you can see it kind of from here so this is a, a optical picture of our galaxy and we are in the plane so when you look through the plane of the galaxy you see lots and lots and lots of dust clouds and to investigate what is happening in the center you need to look through all those dust clouds so how can we do that? Well, that is part of the reason why we're observing microwaves and radio waves, uh, but also it can be observed in infrared, as um, I will ask Natalie to, to explain in a video that she, uh, that she prepared. So let me show you. All right, so in this experiment, we're going to be seeing what objects look like in the infrared. So here you can see we have just two regular old plastic bags, but here's our little infrared camera. But when you look at it in the infrared, you can clearly see that one bag has, you know, it's dark, it's purple, but it looks like the other bag has something underneath it because you can see that bright yellowish orange. So now I just have two just plain old two cups of water underneath these bags. But to cover it back up again. Now these are just two regular old you know cups of water. But again when you look at it in the infrared, it seems like one of the cups of water has more of a glow to it than the other one does. So the one that doesn't have any heat signature coming off of it, but the other cup of water does have a heat signature coming off of it. And so this is what it looks like in the infrared. You can even see like the degrees when you go over it. Yes. So the what uh, Natalie has just uh, shown in this in this experiment is, I mean, you, you can have, uh, for instance, these this plastic bags and you don't see what is happening inside. Uh, but with infrared, we can see through this material and see actually that one of them has a hot cup of water while the other one has a cold cup of water. So, so we can use infrared to see through, um, through material. And uh, that is exactly uh, the idea of how to explore the center of the galaxy uh, and it, use, uh, it was using radio waves and infrared uh, radiation and that was a huge contribution from uh, Dr. Guess and Dr. Genso uh, using uh, some of the largest telescopes in the planet that can observe in near infrared to study what is happening in the center of the galaxy. So the great idea was not just simply to use one of the largest telescope to study this, but also uh, remember the, the problem kind of that we had with observations with the, with the VLA. I was mentioning uh, that you need to observe these calibrators to correct for what the atmosphere is doing, right? Well, it turns out that in uh, microwaves, so kind of what I do, uh, we can observe a calibrator and then our source and then the calibrator again, uh, because the atmosphere doesn't change that much um, when you observe in microwaves, but the atmosphere changes a lot when you observe in infrared. So they, they, they 
cannot do this type of uh, of observations uh is is completely is completely different so so they basically need to have uh the equivalent of a bright star always there when they are observing so that they can correct for what is happening with the with the atmosphere and uh that is that is done by creating artificial stars so basically you have a really powerful laser you send the powerful laser to the upper atmosphere and then you basically create a bright spot in the upper atmosphere you generate an artificial star and then you track how that artificial star is changing because the atmosphere is turbulent it is changing how um, the image of that artificial star and you can correct uh, for those changes and, and your, your data and then get a really sharp uh, picture of the object that you are studying. This is what is called adaptive optics and both groups, uh, the, the, the German group, the European group and the, the group in the US, they were really uh, successful in, in doing this. Uh, the idea is um, you send again a very powerful laser to the upper atmosphere, you generate an artificial star and then you, you have the light from that artificial star coming back. Uh, it, it crosses the atmosphere, that light gets all distorted and then you detect the light. And then you modified uh, the shape of a mirror in real time to correct for the distortion happen uh, because of the of the atmosphere. And then when you're observing uh, your object, let's say the center of the galaxy, and you're observing it and you get the signal that is all distorted, you can use this information from your artificial star to deform the mirror and correct it in real time and get a really sharp image. Right, that is the idea of adaptive optics, and it was uh, revolutionary. Uh, both groups were able to obtain amazing images of the center of our galaxy in infrared. So they were able to pass through all that dust uh, that you cannot study in optical, and in addition, correct for the atmosphere. So you can get really sharp images to see what is really happening. And uh, yeah, so this one is a picture from uh, the group of uh, UCLA using the Keck telescope and this one from the, the group uh, in ESO. And, but it's not only that, not only a picture, but you can obtain the picture day after day, month after month, year after year, and they have done this for 30 years. And then you can see the stars moving. Uh, this is truly amazing. So this, uh, each one of these, um, uh, blobs of color uh, represents one of these stars observing the infrared and you see them going around like comets in our solar system so they are they are going around an object here in the center that as you see is not glowing at all it's not glowing at all uh, and you have stars that are going around that object as if they are just little comets um, and the the data uh, the, uh, has been improving and improving Proven and improving year after year. So this is uh, one of the of the stars, the orbit of one of the stars that is uh, the most famous of, of all these ones is this SO2 or just S2, depending on the group, they call it different. And this is a kind of nice star because it has uh, an orbit that is, clo is, is, is small. So they have been able to track the star for two orbits already. And, and with, um, with this, they can track, again, the orbit of the star, they can measure the period, they can measure how big the orbit is. Uh, that was the data from 20 years ago. This is the data from uh, just a few years ago that was, was published. It is amazing. The, the error bars on the tracking of the orbit is uh, spectacular. They can also measure how the stars are moving away from us or towards us. And with this, they can truly measure the properties of the central object that is responsible for uh, the motion of this star. Uh, and with this, they have concluded that uh, this star, this particular star, uh, is moving in a really eccentric orbit. So for those of you that have taken uh, mechanics, you may remember that an eccentricity of zero is a circle, an eccentricity of one is a parabola. So it's a, a orbit that is close, it's an ellipse, but it's, um, it's, it's quite eccentric, quite elongated. And this object gets really, really close to the center of mass. Uh, so basically as, uh, distance that is comparable to the size of the solar system. And based on how fast this star is moving and how big the orbit is, uh, they can measure the mass of that central object as, a, as around 4 million solar masses. So the, and not only that, they can measure the, the inclination of the, of the plane of the orbit. So 
this is this is quite amazing. So you have an um, object in the center of the galaxy that has four uh, million solar masses. Now, using radio observations with telescopes like the VLA and other telescopes, and this is just an example of one publication, uh, they have been able to put limits on the angular size of the object based on radio um, signals. And here's just a, a zooming literal animation of looking at that central object. We know that central object that is called Sagittarius A star is smaller than around one astronomical unit. So it's smaller than the distance from here to the sun. Okay. And from infrared observations, so what, what uh, the contribution of those two groups, we know that there are around 4 million solar masses in that object. And it is not glowing. It's not glowing. You cannot detect it in the infrared. The stuff is not glowing. 4 million suns in um, a volume is smaller than the distance from here to the sun and it's not glowing, right? How is that possible? Uh, well, the only um, uh, current explanation for that is having one of these supermassive black holes in the, uh, in the center of our galaxy. That again is, is, is quite nice because it connects the theoretical work uh, of Penrose saying like, well, uh, general relativity does predict that these objects should exist and with reality uh, that is finding one of the best examples of supermassive black holes uh, in one that is not that far from us in the center of our own galaxy. So this is our celebration of the Nobel Prize in Physics this, this year. Uh, now I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, so we do have one question at this time. Uh, rest of you, if you have questions, please start uh, typing them up in the chat window. Uh, let me read out the first question that we have. It's from one of our students, Alaric. Uh, he is asking, how does one deform the mirror? Yeah, so, so that one is an interesting engineering um, 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 problem, right? So, okay, so the idea is that you know how the image should look, right, on your, on your, um, on the star. So let me just go back here so I can go back to that slide. Oops, just give me a second. Okay, just a minute. All right, I'm gonna go there. What I get there, uh, in uh, you may have heard that there are two different types of telescopes, right? There are some telescopes that are called refracting that you, they use the lenses, and then reflecting telescopes that use mirrors. Now, the largest telescopes um, use mirrors because you just need the surface uh, in order to track or uh, to focus the light, right? Uh, likewise. There. Likewise, for some reason, my computer has some issues jumping those slides. Yes. So, um, so the nice thing about a, a mirror is that you can make it really thin, right? And you still will have the surface that can reflect the, the light. So how, how the system works is you have a, a thin mirror that you can put little motors at the different points in the back of the, of the mirror. And then you have a CCD camera um, that you will get an image of the reflected light from the star, right? And when you do that, you won't get the star that is in the, in the point where it was supposed to be, but it's off. And then the mirror is deformed quickly so that uh, the secondary, the, actually the tertiary mirror uh, is deformed quickly so that the, the, the light of the star gets to the, the center again of what it was supposed to be. And then the atmosphere changes again and moves the star to a different position and the mirror is deformed again to put it back. So it's basically a, um, um, a feedback loop between the CCD that detects the position of the star and the shape of the mirror. So the, the star moves you change the shape of the mirror. So basically you change a little bit of the, um, the shape here as represented in this, uh, in this figure. 
to bring the star back to where it was supposed to be. The atmosphere changes again, you do it again. And you have to do it really fast. And while that is happening, you are also getting the data from this from the object that you're observing. So, so the, the image that you're getting is corrected um, uh, for this effect of the atmosphere. Yes. So in the case of uh, what we do in, in radio astronomy, the interesting thing about this is that we don't need to do it in real time. We can get the data. We can basically record the, the, uh, the effect that the atmosphere has on the signal, and we can apply the corrections later on in post-processing. Uh, and that is a huge advantage in radio astronomy, but you cannot do that in optical or, or infrared. Uh, we have one more question from uh, Professor Meager. Uh, you have mentioned supermassive black holes. Are all black holes supermassive or can they be different masses? Yes, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, they can be different masses. In fact, the, the idea here, this original idea was from stellar evolution, right? And let me kind of just go back to that slide. Almost there. There. Okay. So, so this idea of uh, what will happen with a massive star. So I, this one I mentioned, it has, when, when it was young, it had a mass of more or less 20 solar masses or something like that, right? And when it explodes, uh, quite a bit of material will be sent out, right? So only the core is compressed and therefore you will have only a fraction of the original mass there. So, so these are what are called stellar mass black holes and, and therefore they will have masses of a lot larger than around three solar masses. And, um, and that was what it was first thought, right? On, on the black holes will be. But uh, yeah, the, the interesting thing is that in the case of the quasars, uh, you need these this really massive ones, these supermassive black holes, like the one that we have in the center of the galaxy. So, uh, so basically from the early days in the, in the 60s, it was uh, quite clear that one could have um, a, black holes that were stellar type, right? Uh, products of this type of evolution or black holes that were supermassive uh, in the core of galaxies. Now, how those supermassive black holes are formed, it is still unclear. And, um, and for actually for a long, long time, uh, there were no examples of black holes of intermediate masses between the stellar masses of a few solar masses, right? The idea, and uh, the, the thousands and millions of solar, the millions of solar masses. There were there were basically no known. Uh, it was just until uh, the the LIGO uh, uh, probe, the well, telescope, right, that there are now uh, several examples of intermediate mass black holes. So, in other words, uh, there are more and more examples of black holes that are from the stellar. Type. So basically 10 solar masses or so to millions of solar masses, hundreds of millions of, uh, of solar masses to basically a billion is the, 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 some of the most massive ones based on the, on the brightness. Um, yep. And, but again, the formation of a stellar mass black hole, uh, details are not clear, but, uh, but the overall idea seems to be quite robust. The formation of the supermassive ones, uh, that one is not quite clear um, because how can you form such a, such an object? Somehow you have to merge material, right? And uh, it takes time for material to lose their angular momentum, their property of just like to be rotating, right? So, so you have to get rid of that angular momentum so that the material can get close enough so that the density can be high enough uh, so that the gravitational force will be strong enough that uh, you create those trap surfaces. And based on Penrose, once you have the trap surfaces, that was it, right? Whatever happens inside will happen, yeah, but you will have that um, boundary of the black hole. The other kind of interesting aspect related to the, to the question is that uh, we don't truly understand what is happening inside the black hole. So the, the predictions of Penrose um, are based on general relativity and uh, we know that general relativity is it's not complete, right? It, it doesn't, it, it, it's not designed to explain what is happening at the smallest scales, right? So, so we don't know whether truly singularities have zero, I mean, they, 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 everything collapses to an infinite density, 
right in the center. Um, however, it, it basically Penrose and, and, and people like like uh, Hopkins Hopkins showed that it, maybe there is no way for us to know it anyway, right? Because uh, we cannot get information from the inside of the a black hole except uh, symmetry and mass and, and spin uh, in charge. So, um, so whether it's so, so the point of the existence of the black hole uh, is independent of whether of what is happening exactly with the singularity, right? And that again is is one of the uh, major uh, contributions of Penrose. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Raja, for those answers. Any other questions anybody has? Students in the audience. Okay. There's a new question. Dr. Raja, can you make some... Yeah, let me ask a question. Can you make some comments on the... Uh, actual image of the black hole that was recently attained. Mm -hmm. Yes, so so this image here, right? Uh, yeah, so it's quite a bit of an achievement. So so the the idea is using interferometry, so similar to the very large array. Uh, however, if if you want to get this type of resolution, right? So looking really what is inside here, you need a telescope that is huge, right? And in fact, what was done was is something called a, a very long baseline interferometry in which you don't have the telescopes truly connected. Uh, you just record the information independently and then later on you, you correlate the information. So, so it's kind of the ultimate idea of post-processing. You kind of get all the data first and then you combine the data uh, to be able to to correct for the atmosphere and everything that I kind of discussed and then get the, get this image. Now, also, the, the higher the frequency, the sharper the image you can get. But the higher the frequency, the more problematic the atmosphere is. And if you are observing, well, you have a telescope in the South Pole and a telescope in Hawaii, and, and they are trying to work together, then you have atmosphere that is doing completely different things in different places of the planet. So it's a huge, huge, huge challenge. And the Event Horizon Telescope, um, I think they were able to uh, get enough data with enough good weather uh, so that they could uh, do this, this post-processing process kind of that we do in uh, radio astronomy to uh, obtain the, the image. Uh, a, a huge difference between, let's say, the, the image of a star forming region, like the type of work that we do, uh, I'm not sure if I have it kind of far, so it will take me a while to get there. And um, in the image of this supermassive black hole is that kind of the work we do, you know, we have, uh, for instance, with the VLA 27 telescopes working simultaneously to get the image. In this case, there were few telescopes and, um, and then the image quality is far worse. Uh, and that has been one of the, what was one of the challenges for that group to convince themselves that what they were seeing, this, this kind of donut structure was real and not an artifact. Um, but uh, it, it was a robust um, uh, detection showing again the, the emission from light that is just outside of the event horizon that the, the curved space-time uh, focus the light in different directions, right? And then you can get some intense uh, uh, radiation in a ring. And based on the size of the ring, based on the brightness uh, of the of the ring, you can compare this with lots of models uh, on how the black hole will look depending on the mass, depending on the orientation, depending on the spin, and then get information about um, about the object itself. Another really interesting aspect about this is that you can get the distance to the object in a completely independent way. Uh, and, their, and, and distances in astronomy are really important because, for instance, we use them to study the expansion of the universe, right? So, so using uh, or imaging of supermassive black holes this way uh, is, is another way of, of measuring distances that then can be used to explore problems like, for instance, dark energy in the universe that is uh, this strange substance that works like anti-gravity that is pushing the universe apart. 
Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. I have one quick kind of follow up question on that. And then we have another couple of questions from our guests. So the question I have with regards to this M87 image is, can we image the same way the black hole at the center of our own galaxy? Yeah, that, 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 yeah basically everyone will, be, will, will say, wait a minute, why do we need, why, why this was the first image, right? Why this was the first image? It's a, it's a galaxy that is far away, right? Why is this one the first image of a supermassive black hole and not the one in the center of the galaxy? Well, it is this um, problem again. Let me kind of go back to this one here. This problem again. All right. So it's not only uh, not only dust that we have here. Let me kind of get my pointer. It's not only dust that we have here, but also all these massive stars that are forming and massive stars that explode as supernovas that create a, a cloud of plasma in the center of the galaxy, right? And just like our atmosphere plays with the light, optical light when it uh, comes, plasma also plays with the path of the light when it comes in optic, in infrared and in microwaves, um, wavelengths. So, it is hard to get an image of the center of the galaxy because you have you are inside that swimming pool of plasma. And then when the light is traveling, you not only have to correct for what our atmosphere is doing, but in principle, you have to correct for what the complete galaxy is doing, right? All those free electrons between the center of the galaxy and us. And, and that is a challenge. And in fact, it is, there are some ideas that may be just too much, too, too much of this uh, scattering. Um, and it may, be not be, may not be possible to actually get the image because simply it comes too distorted from the beginning, right? So then looking not towards the center of the galaxy, but looking at a different galaxy, right? In which the orientation is, um, is good. So, so basically looking not through this disk, where there is quite a bit of material, but looking at an angle is better because you don't have that much of that material around. And that is the idea of that, of that other galaxy. Not only, not only that, the orientation was, was better, but also uh, the supermassive black hole in that galaxy is far, far bigger than the one in our galaxy. And therefore the, super, the, the image was, was larger, right? Even if it is farther away, the angular size was still larger, it would compensate. But it still could happen. But uh, well, thank last you again. Thing I yeah, let me move on different. to the. Yeah, you were saying something. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yes. Right, so let me move on to the next question. Uh, one of our guests is asking why can spin or charge information come out of the event horizon? Yes. So. Um, well, that the 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 charge, I guess that one will be similar to understand than um, than mass, right? So we can measure the mass of a black hole, right? So even if all the mass is concentrated there in the center, uh, the the we can measure that because of the effect that it has with the with the surroundings. So the um, uh, the same the same story uh, is with the with the case of the charge. So if there is a, a charge imbalance, then theoretically, it will be possible theoretically to detect. However, uh, there is really, really little charge imbalance in the universe, right? Uh, so, so, so that one is more in the in the in the realm of uh, a theoretical possibility, right? Because uh, you will need a huge charge imbalance to be able to know. And if you have a huge charge imbalance then the plasma will shield from itself and then, and then basically get to, to neutral conditions again. So, so that statement is, is more from the pure um, uh, general relativity idea, not from, from an observational uh, perspective. Now, the part about the spin, that one is observational uh, because it turns out that depending on how the black hole spins, so whatever is happening inside, um, it will have some 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 rotation, right? And maybe it's infinite in, uh, density, or maybe it's not. But but you have some type of internal structure, and that internal structure is spinning. You don't know exactly what is happening, but uh, but you have the surroundings. Well, depending on that um, 
symmetry, whatever you have inside, it will modify the event horizon. And another region outside that one that is called the ergosphere, that is a, a region in which the space time are, are coupled and you can transfer energy of rotation to the surroundings, basically. And, um, and therefore, based on that, you can infer what is happening inside, like the internal distribution, um, the, the symmetry of that internal distribution. That is, that is the idea. And, and actually, it's quite robust. And that is how, for instance, the, the, the properties of the supermassive black hole in M87 um, was so, so well uh, determined. Because depending on the type of spin, uh, you will get a different type of shadow of that image. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, is it possible to get radiation from the event horizon? All right. So, so just from outside, yes. And, and that is kind of the, the reason why these quasars are so bright. So just outside here of the event horizon, uh, there can be a, basically a, 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 the gravitational energy can be efficiently far more efficient than nuclear processes, right? So a thermonuclear explosion, that, that kind of atomic bomb, so that, that is nothing with respect to the efficiency of converting gravitational energy uh, into, uh, for instance, electromagnetic energy in, um, in, this, in these regions here. Um, now, from the event horizon itself, uh, or in, in inside, so the, the, the answer just in general relativity is no. And that one is what, again, Penrose wrote really kind of careful in that paper in the 63 and 65, right? That if we take a look at this one, let me go back to um, the singularity theorem. Uh, that is, once you form that trap surface, uh, it is impossible within the theory of general relativity and with positive energy density to prevent collapse towards a singularity. Basically, what he's saying is, OK, so if you just use general relativity and you don't have uh, matter, like basically anti-gravitational material <laughs> kind of thing, uh, then this is the, the prediction, right? This is carefully written. That is kind of the fun thing when you write a scientific paper, right? You, you write it so carefully that you, what you say you're sure it's correct, even if it is incomplete. <laughs> Right, and the part about incomplete here is yeah, this is just uh, general relativity. The the one of the um, huge uh, contributions of Hawking was to uh, Stephen Hawking was to realize that if you uh, couple general relativity with some aspects of quantum mechanics, then you could actually have uh, effectively uh, radiation out of a black hole, and and the, the idea is that. Um, a black hole can, with the production of pairs of particles, virtual particles, at right at the edge of the event horizon, you could effectively decrease the mass of the singularity and effectively send that mass outwards in form of, of particles or in energy. So, um, and, and the idea of that one is that if you give it enough time and the universe uh, doesn't have enough radiation, so the universe expands a lot, then you will be able to evaporate the black hole. Now that one, those are ideas beyond general relativity, and um, but it's it's possible based on on that. But but again, that connection between quantum mechanics and general relativity that has not been done. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Araja, for all those answers. We don't have any more questions, so I would like to encourage all of you to unmute yourselves and we give a loud uh, round of applause to Dr. Araja for his nice presentation and meeting uh, us on the Nobel Prize work. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, okay, all right. So that's it for today. 